thanks thanks for for being here first of all it's um it's my pleasure to to have these events and particularly because i haven't received the book in my hands <laughs> um i i moved countries recently so i didn't get the book where i was living previously but um I'm very happy to discuss this here. I just wanted to show you a little picture. I don't know if Bernardo could allow me to share screens, um, if that's possible. Um, so I can show you a little picture of the initial jotting of what this book was going to be like. I don't know if you can see it now. You should yeah yeah should should here yeah. uh, can you see the the picture yeah yeah it's not very um, clear yeah. but we can see it yeah it's not very clear but um the idea is that we were jotting in this whiteboard different themes and we started thinking about a book that addresses um, a number of key ideas that we felt that resonated with our fieldwork. At the time, we were doing a postdoctoral uh, fellowship in Trento, and homing became a space to think about home or push the boundaries of what actually home is or what we thought home could be. And in this case, we were thinking about all these themes. So we started jotting in whiteboard different things. And this is the picture at the time that we use for reference to start thinking about the themes. And it's scale, immobility, diversity, time, or history, or uh, temporality, immateriality. Then we thought about the environment, but we, we put it out, inequality or everyday life, but then in the end we chose inequality. So this book became um, um, a sort of a reflection of um, this space for thinking about home. Uh, in my personal case, I took up um, scale and temporalities because I felt in my fieldwork that home was happening also beyond the domestic space with my research informants. So um, I was interested in thinking about home, not in terms of size as small scale or large scale, but more about how these changing relationships that constitute home um, produce these, these uh, different dimensions or different scales. Uh, what I found in my fieldwork, and I reflected in the book, in the chapter of scales, is that the experience of migration rescales home. And by that, I mean that we assign different meanings to home that go to different realms or different spaces. And uh, that happens when we dislocate. Um, also, in thinking about these spaces, I was taking into account that most of the literature privileges space over time. So when I was thinking about scale, then I thought, oh, well, time is also important. You know, it's, it's not only about where it happens, but how or for how long or how fast it happens or how slow it happens. So we tend to portray lives or domestic lives in a continuous way as a progression from beginning to the end. But what I found in researching about the temporalities of home is that there are multiple and often conflicting temporalities happening in the domestic environment. So that's um, something that I found through the case of an Airbnb in Madrid. Um, I take that case in the book and I analyze how <clears throat> through everyday practices, people produce pockets of privacy or tiny spaces of privacy or publicness um, at different moments of the day and in different days of the week. So I didn't have the chance to stay in this Airbnb for a very long time, but in the time that I stayed, I could see how the home or this public, semi-public, semi-private house becomes temporalized through different practices. So that's, these were my two, two themes. There were many others that we had to rule out, but um, these, these were some of the interesting things. I also wanted to comment just to finish my intervention about the co-authoring process of this book. Um, this book, first of all, is not a, an edited collection. We thought about it <clears throat> as a form of collective thinking. So each of us wrote individual chapters, uh, but the overall concept and the motivation behind this book, the overarching theme, um, 
it's a product of the our meetings in Trento. We used to meet in Trento um, roughly once a month to discuss our advances in fieldwork. And we started thinking about these themes in June 2017. Yeah. And then we became, uh, we, we came up with a more solid uh, book project in early 2018. <clears throat> so in this period, we were conducting field work and all these ideas emerged from the discussion face-to-face uh, -face in Trento, but also online discussions. And we used to make the joke that every time we had an initiative, we produced a Google Docs um, document and they were making fun of me because every time we something came up, oh, let's make a Google Doc and let's jot these ideas. So it actually became a, a project like that. We started at Google Doc with these jottings from the whiteboard. We put ideas together and it became a book in that way. So it, it is very collective in that sense. We have individual chapters written by individual authors, but it is a collective uh, project. So in retrospective, I think what allows us to, to produce this collective uh, work is the ability to criticize each other's work, to read carefully each other and to criticize each other's work. And also it's possible because we developed a degree of trust in, in joining these meetings in Trento <clears throat> and in doing things together, conducting fieldwork, uh, comparing our fieldworks, trying to find ways to contrast our different uh, ways of, of doing fieldwork. Also, we have different disciplinary backgrounds. So in reconciling these differences, we developed a degree of trust that allowed us to to criticize each other's in a in an open way, and uh, I think this book also emerges as as these uh, readings, mutual readings. Um, so just to wrap it up, um, I wanted to say that this book um, stands for me personally as a way of pushing uh, what home is, pushing the conceptualization of home and to think about home in, in ways that have been suggested in the literature, but they haven't been explicitly developed. And we were thinking about home as a scalar, home as material that has been widely developed in the literature, but also how these materials co or shape or mutually, the mutual relationship between people and materials and how they shape each other's lives or shape each other's context. Also how home uh, has to do with uh, mobility and immobility, uh, how it becomes temporalized and how home becomes uh, gendered or unequal. So these themes have to, a lot to do with each other and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to see it now crystallized in this book. So I should leave it there by now. Thank you. Thanks very much. Alejandro, so who is coming next? I don't know, because you disrupted the plan. So Aurora, what do you feel like? Do you prefer, uh, I mean, do you prefer getting starting now? Or do you want me to do it first as you wish? As you wish, no problem for me. I can, I can start now, but if you want to, you can, you can go now and then I will. So I think I will, I will conclude. Follow mm -hmm. the orders of the author. So please feel free to, to get down now. No, go ahead. I will, I will conclude. Okay. Okay. <laughs> That's fine. Okay. So, um, actually my idea today was to get started at any point by thanking not only the people who are, you know, present here somehow online, but also to thank those who are in absence, they are part of the book. And I mean that actually we owe, um, I mean, we owe much gratitude to all our interlocutors, to all our research participants in four months, to all those who were our hosts while we were conducting actually ethnographic research. Who, I mean, who let us enter at some stage their homes their, while we were conducting home visiting, home visits and trying to, uh, to, to even record or any way, any way jot down their narrative, their home narratives. It is thanks to our research informants that today we are here discussing the book. So I would like to, uh, to make this clear that, I mean, there's another part of the of the book of actually the co-authors in absence of the book were not here, of course, today. So as 
I mean, when it comes to the selection of, um, of the chapters, actually of the keywords, uh, in my case, I, I think it was uh, uh, more, than, uh, more than a random choice, actually, to, um, for me to select those two uh, words, materiality and immateriality and diversities. Uh, I think that at the time we were concerned also with making our points kind of an interdisciplinary. In fact, if I look back at my chapter on materiality, I can see that I was trying to, um, to connect social anthropology, which is of course my uh, disciplinary background, but also material cultural study and what I would say postmodern material cultural studies in, in the sense of phenomenology and also uh, emotional and affect. Uh, um, subjectivity. So in, uh, I mean, I, I wouldn't like to spend many, too many words on that chapter also because I know that uh, Maya is, uh, I mean, is strong on materiality, so she can do that much better than I can. But I was trying in the, in the chapter to go through uh, a round of domestic objects which made sense uh, in the lives of my research informants and in their home experiences. So I literally tried to, uh, to take the readers with me to sit across a round of sofas, to, to go and you know, uh, sort of feel the excitement in preparing, sending, and possibly receiving a transnational parcel are sort of delivery boxes from, uh, uh, from people left behind or from your family who has moved forth in another, in another country, another continent. Uh, the third object, the third, object which I uh, focused my attention upon was the webcam. So the idea that also uh, digital culture, not only material culture, but also a digital culture is very much part and parcel of our own experiences today. Ever more, uh, I mean, ever more this month while, you know, I mean, most of the populations worldwide have been forced uh, due to lockdowns and so forth to stay home, to maintain what is physical distancing, so to try to connect with some social devices, social media devices. Uh, I actually felt a little bit, if I may say, uh, awkward in, uh, in getting published the other chapter, which is authored by myself, but the chapter on diversities, because at the time, I think it's probably within the book uh, is the, more, the most personal chapter. I was facing at the time a sort of, uh, let's call it family breakdown. Uh, so I actually turned at the time to feminist geography to, uh, to get myself, uh, you know, back, uh, uh, you know, back on the run. So in the chapter on diversities, I, I applied a sort of intersectional approach to try and see how different, uh, um, let's say, social axes such as gender and age, but also sexuality, race and class may affect migrant and non-migrant may affect mobile and non-mobile people experiences at home. So I tried to reason over three different issues of starting from domestic violence, moving on to queer households and ending with the, uh, the sort of, you know, the matter of housework. Who does the housework? I mean, who are the homemakers? And what about the case of domestic workers, of those who do housework being waged, being paid for doing that in someone else's home, not in their own homes. Uh, so I would say you can, I mean, my own chapters, but all the six chapters in the book do witness uh, and do uh, somehow prove how singularities and commonalities uh, were somehow, uh, you know, uh, entangled within uh, the architecture, the framework of our volume. Um, I would like to uh, to get down to I mean to wrap up my uh, my small intervention, trying to um, to convey which were let's say the common themes or anyway the uh, red threads which actually run across the book. Uh, three were again uh, we had three sort of keywords uh, which are uh, somehow present in all the chapters, and those keywords were threshold and thresholds process and social change. What do we meant by that? Uh, I mean, when we, when we talk about thresholds, of course, we're not only um, addressing the, uh, let's say, the strip of a, um, the bottom strip of a doorway. 
that bottom street which may allow or may forbid the people's crossing, people's entering or exiting. But we are trying to, um, to make clear how uh, not only, I mean, features of interior design help demarcating space and times for inclusion and exclusion in private homes as much as in public spaces. Uh, let's also say that, uh, I mean, um, this discourse of threshold uh, goes back to how I would frame uh, the sort of host and guest relationship with, with, that we tried to, uh, to entertain with our research participants. I would say that while us as ethnographers, we're trying to reach some cultural intimacies with people in their very home places, there was a, let's say, a, a complex uh, allocation, if you like, of license and prescription from certain home areas, from certain staff, from certain habits which were put into places. Uh, and those intersections account for, um, for a coming together of subjects, of relational bonds, uh, and even of emotional effects. Uh, when I think about, uh, um, I mean, I just mentioned the fact that actually thresholds also make sense when we look at how home is produced. In fact, I mean, uh, at the very, um, you know, at the very background of this project, of this book project, uh, is, um, is actually the, the project Homing, actually. So when we talk about homing, uh, when we talk about homemaking in the book, we try to infuse movement, to infuse temporalities and diversities again in, uh, in, an, in the notion of home just to make it you know, as effective as a progressive verb, if you like. So in, in the book, all across the chapters, you may see how home is being trying to be made and made and remade by people on the move. So we see different, I would say a constellation of enactments, of performances, of everyday habits. I mean, if we go back to the idea of dwelling as a form of habituation, of getting used to doing things in a certain manner, in a certain place, then you, you get there the, uh, the meaning of what homemaking and homemaking practices meant for us uh, in our uh, ethnography. And then very last, uh, I just spent one minute thinking about social change. I mean, we, um, we started out the book and we, we got to the end of the book uh, uh, trying to make the point uh, come across uh, that actually social change occurs both behind closed doors uh, and outside those, uh, those doors. I mean, both in the private dwelling of the people we were interviewing, we were meeting, and also in the public spaces or anyway in those different scales, like Alejandro has just said, different scales of home where people nowadays try to make themselves somehow at home, I would say, so try to make themselves in conditions in, let's say, lived spaces of control, security, familiarity, and at a time when home today has become really a place of shelter or even a place of enforced quarantine for millions, I would say that it's ever more important that we reflect on what home as an idea, as a notion, as a setting, as a relation can afford us to be and to, uh, and to live. So, um, I would like to, to give the floor to Aurora now because I know that she'll, uh, she'll be explaining much better than, uh, than I could ever in these few minutes how the, uh, the methodology that we applied for coming uh, to, uh, to analyze the experiences of home for people upon conditions of mobility, transnational migrants or not, uh, was at the basis of our collective endeavor. Thank you. Okay, um, good morning to everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. And a, spe a special thanks to the Homing Girls for organizing this and to our discussants for accepting the, our invitation. Uh, I am the author of the third and the sixth chapter of the book, which developed our around mobility and immobility on the one hand and on inequalities in, on the one hand. Um, uh, 
concerning the reason why I we decide I decide to, to focus on these two chapter, um, I want to say that the idea to include a chapter on immobility into our book came from my long term interest on the interplay between people's mobility and the regime of mobility that govern migrants' attempt to move and that often immobilize them in condition of displacement, uh, temporariness, and liminality, such as a refugee camp, uh, reception and uh, detention center, or just while they are waiting to cross a certain border. And these interests strongly, strongly resonate with the fieldwork that I conduct for the homing project, whereby I focus on people from Somalia and Eritrea that were mainly forced migrants and whose biography were dotted by these experiences of being immobilized, both during their life trajectory and as well as during their everyday life in Europe. Um, this moment when, um, so, so, so I wonder how our homing practices and feeling um, are reshaped in this vital conjuncture. This is a kind of question that I, that I ask uh, in, the, in, the, in the first of the chapter. Uh, and although the notion of home may appear at first glimpse, as irrelevant in places of display, displacement and transit, uh, my research alongside with other uh, scholars suggests that people continuously make efforts to improve their living condition. And these efforts may in turn produce a sense of familiarity, security and control. So that's creating a feeling of being at home somewhere. So in other words, people may, may make home even, even if they don't feel really at home, even, even if they try to resist making a home or are not supposed to make a home in a certain place. But in the chapter, I also decide to include also a highly mobile professional with the intention of de-exceptionalizing migrants and refugees and putting their experiences of home and of lack of home vis-a-vis -vis experiences of other mobile people. Um, the chapter on inequalities was instead inspired by the analytical and I would say also political need to stress that the multiple intersectional structural obstacle that many migrants face in Europe today in their process of homing uh, due to many forms of discrimination, racial, legal, legal, inaccessible job markets, social services, and so on, that often result in poor or marginalized housing conditions. Uh, this, of course, implies to shed light on the exclusionary discourses and practices uh, uh, that codify home and nation as a site of exclusion. Uh, but my aim was not too much to delve into the political, um, social uh, processes behind the unequal access to housing, but looking for a more ethnographic perspective. And th uh, so I was interested in uh, exploring the senses and the practices of homemaking, which emerge in condition of housing inequalities, and how we people perceive and face and um, experience these inequalities in relation to home, to their search of home. Uh, so the chapter, in that chapter, my point is to highlight the role of home as a critical value, to recall Brun, and its role in migrants' well-being. And it is a point I think that can be also relevant for policy-oriented discourses. Um, before giving the floor to our discussants, I want to spend a few more words about the research methodology, as I already um, anticipated, um, to give somehow justice to the word ethnography that opens the title of the book. Um, although it is true that we have tried to, concept to conceptually enrich uh, the notion of home, um, enhancing its processual, its multidimensional, its multisensorial uh, aspect. We also sought to report and understand the actual imaginative, aspired, remembered, uh, desired experiences of home of our research participants that we access during our ethnography. Uh, as already mentioned, this book is based on our ethnography fieldwork that we conduct in five different European countries in 2017-2018 among migrants from three different regions of the world, South America, uh, South Asia and the Horn of Africa. And together we, we work with six different groups of migrants. 
Um, this six group of migrants gave us a variety of mig migratory experiences from uh, uh, forced migrants, labor, highly skilled migrants, uh, second or third generation, women and men, old people and young people. Um, so it, it gave us a very rich, um, a very rich material. And from a methodological point of view, uh, this investigation was based on qualitative technique data collection, so interviews, life stories, uh, but also to a strong attention to the practices we understand home as founded in routines, embodied practices, senses, conscious and unconscious action. Um, so, so the home visit also were, were, were important, where we analyze threshold, furniture, decoration, the materialities, but also the practices of hospitality. And, and as already mentioned, um, uh, um, probably get, entering in, in a migrant's home was one of the most challenging aspects of our research where our positionality in terms of gender, nationality, skin colors, social class, and education play an important role. Um, however, as already mentioned, we took in consideration not only the private dwelling of our interlocutors, but also public and semi-public spaces, such as worship places, ethnic restaurants, uh, public parks, squares, because our research demonstrates how this, this, this setting may spur feelings of attachment and familiarity for specific group of migrants. And the last point I want to make is that our research was not only multi-sided, but was generally comparative. Uh, there was a kind of comparison that was not made ex post, I mean, after we finish with the ethnography, but the comparative effort infused our ethnographic work. Um, we, we, we did, we carried out uh, individual field work, but, uh, and, and also we have our own interests, our own background, our own personal inclination, and this emerge in the book, I think. But at the same time, we share the theoretical background. Uh, we have common guidelines that somehow help us to um, make our field work somehow always in touch with each other. And also we, uh, we conducted this, uh, this monthly meeting um, where we discuss collectively our empirical findings. We exchange feedback and idea with the same um, mutual trust that Alejandro before mentioned before. And this, I think, activate a sort of virtual circle among individual fieldwork and collective analysis and collective thinking. And I think that this book is one of the results of this uh, virtual circle. Thank you. Thanks very much, Aurora, as well as Sarah and uh, Alejandro. So we can move uh, to the uh, next step with the uh, discussion, starting with uh, Professor Maya Pozbranovic Rickman. Thanks very much, Maya, for taking the floor. Um, good morning or good day, everyone. My name is Maya Pozbranovic Rickman, as Paolo said, and I am a professor of ethnology at Malmö University in Sweden. I am of Croatian origin and actually have been spending half of my uh, life and career in, in Croatia to start with before moving to, to Sweden. So reading this book was very interesting, of course, uh, in professional terms, but for all of us who have been migrating or living elsewhere or can define ourselves as migrant, as I cer certainly can, it's also touching upon moments of, of, of self-recognition or recognition or, or some kind of... It, 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 it in, evokes a special dim dimension of, of reflection that is also very private, uh, which I think is wonderful because it's informing our understanding in, in uh, yet another profound way. Uh, so thank you very much for inviting me um, to participate here. Of course, uh, we said uh, we fixed this date a couple of months ago, or I don't remember when exactly, but now it comes in. In a, in a week that has in the meantime been packed with, with different kind of, uh, kinds of workplace meetings. Uh, so it's, <laughs> it's a very busy period, but then I want to mention this because it's really a relief and a pleasure to take this one and a half hour to talk about ideas and research results that we really care for. 
and use this um, uh, way of communication uh, that we are unfortunately getting more and more used to uh, for this kind of very pleasant, uh, pleasant meeting around ideas. Um, so thank you very much for this, for, for letting me take my time for this particular kind of exercise on Zoom and not only the, the ones that have to do with administration. So as, as was nicely uh, presented already, so I'm not going to, of course, I'm not going to, 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 to repeat things that were said, but indeed, I also see this book as a collective project. I mean, it's obvious who was writing what, who was authoring what, but I see it as a book, that that was the way I conceived of it from, from the first moment I, I got the PDF to, to read it because I was also endorsing the book formally. So I read it carefully. And uh, really in relation to this, of course, this is a short intervention that we were asked to do today. I, I'm not going to comment on particular chapters, but from my partial perspective of a scholar who is interested in transnational migration and materiality in particular, I'm going to talk about some aspects of the book that I find particularly important. And of course, leave aside most other uh, aspects and parts that uh, are also very much worth discussing, but I'm going to just focus on some things of my own primary interest. And um, let me start by just reminding each and everyone here, because I know this is a very uh, um, well-educated <laughs> audience when it comes to the matters that, that we are thinking about today in relation to the book. Let me just remind, uh, remind you that researchers of transnational migration have been very vocal in claiming that migrants may feel at home in several places because the feeling is rooted in effective familiarity, in local knowledge and in social interaction, of course. However, this book goes at length and very much in depth to also explain why this is the case. And it moves between different scales in a comparative effort between in between to explore, to explore how the meaning of home as lived experience goes beyond place. And I find this extremely important and extremely well done. So it's not only claiming, but really explaining, really showing. And of course this showing relies on ethnography and it can't be over um, like repeated how, how important it is that it is based on a well done ethnography um, that is uh, that has actually been taking the time it needed so it was it, it, it's not based on these short stints but it's based on a really thorough ethnographic work which I find extremely important to remind ourselves on so this enabled the authors to to provide very rich insights by combining multi-scholar temporal and emotional perspective perspectives um, so the contribution of the book to the understanding of home in the context of migration um, is, as I see it, based on, on the one hand, the ability to zoom into the very personal private context, while on the other hand, being also able to provide an understanding of processes that require social, historical and political contextualization. In his very nice foreword to the book, Paolo noted that and I quote, being attentive to mobility at large is also a way to be migranticized migration studies. And there he's referring to Janine Dahinden um, text from 2016 about the need or it, a plea for the migrant, the migranticization of migration studies, an article that I hold very dear and I see as extremely important since the first time I read it a couple of years ago. And I'm so happy to say now in the place of being a discussant that here we are really on the same page. And even if when we meet, when people like us meet who, who understand why this uh, not focusing on migrants per se is a crucial thing to do and started doing consequently and consistently in migration studies. If we, even if we understand why it's important, I'm, Unfortunately, you know, going to migrate, especially migration conferences, it's clear that this message has not come through yet. Yeah. And that so many people don't really understand what would be the point uh, with this. And the, this book is in that sense, even for 
people who might not be interested in home per se or or interested in ethnographic methods per se i i'm going to to be a bit of a Jacobus witness with this book saying that this is the example this is exemplifying what i mean what i understand as the migrantizing migration studies okay so i think this is ext extremely important and the book is very successful in in this regard um, because the book really is forcefully demonstrating that the whatever we can conceptualize as the migrant condition, uh, as Paolo was also saying, while it being a major social marker, it doesn't speak for itself. It's not a social reality for itself. Very important. So the book further makes obvious that the categorization of groups of people as migrants may obscure and uh, and very often obscures the variety of individual or group characteristics or attributes that may matter much more than the migrant label, label as such and by this i'm not talking only about what a particular label or classification means to me as a particular person who might be conceptualized as a migrant in a particular context of course that goes without saying but i'm talking about what is it that we as researchers do not see if we conceptualize people as migrants and if we then again connect to what I just said about the Hinden's plea, um, if we focus our attention on migrants only. Uh, the third thing is that the book challenges the still predominant view of the migrant home experience as essentially different from the experiences of non-migrants. It's all interconnected, as you understand, you understand where, where I'm going, but the migrant home doesn't exist as such, and it can't be set against an equally essentialized native autochthonous or long residence homes. Uh, process, relations, contextualization, practices that make the object of the study here very much alive and changeable. Uh, that is what this book is really forcefully uh, showing and pointing at. So there are several reasons for which I truly like and appreciate this book. Um, A, it's the most welcome contribution to migration scholarship that cuts across typologies of migrants and avoids the ethnic lens, which has been my, yeah, pain. <laughs> it has been painful to see it the ethnicity being presupposed as an explanatory factor over all these years, uh, almost 20 years that, in which I, I could think of myself as a migration scholar. So this book is really avoiding the ethnic lens. Yes, people come from somewhere. Yes, people can be uh, presented as they just were in, in uh, um, Aurora's uh, final words. They come from particular countries. They, they can be seen as members or, or affiliated to particular groups, yet this book definitely is not following the ethnic lens when it comes to analysis and explanation. Moreover, the book provides a deep and multifaceted understanding of the sense of home as a matter of practice. And those of you who have read some of my work, of course, uh, um, will understand that where I'm going to with the practice uh, relates to uh, materiality. And indeed, this book acknowledges that, and I quote here, home can be neither thought of nor attained without some architectures and artifacts, end quote. And thus, to my great joy and uh, interest, the book really makes materiality of homes uh, a focus and takes it seriously. Material culture in translocal and multi-scale domestic set settings stands here as a core of any possible sociocultural analysis of homemaking. And uh, somewhere in the book, we can also read that a material culture perspective on everyday practices and sensations delivers a fundamental critique of purely symbolic and representational approaches to an anthropology of home. So, I mean, I can't over overstate how important this is, even if, uh, Alejandro said that yeah, material culture studies are very well developed and indeed they are to, to our great satisfaction and interest. But, but then again, in migration studies, when it comes to migrants, it is actually 
surprisingly little work that is really focusing on these issues uh, in a sustained way. So this book is really filling a, a gap here. Uh, and uh, I think it should be appreciated for this, especially. Somewhere in the middle of the book, Peggy Levitt and Nina Glick Schiller's very well-known article from 2004 on simultaneity in transnational social field is quoted. And we read, just as assimilation and enduring transnational ties are neither incompatible nor binary opposites, but can be complementary and co-constitutive, homemaking practices can persist and adapt at the same time. Right? So they are having some con elements of continuity, but they are also changing and adapting to new circumstances. And then the author said, there is much to be learned from the processes through which migrants' homemaking practices endure, become reshaped and substituted, particularly in relation to the material basis of household, as well as the meanings and skills that emerge as the part of this process. Further, it is stated in the book that home designs and items intimately interact with people's emotions and relations, contributing to ever-changing landscapes of belonging and affect, ethics and aesthetics. This analytical distinction between being and belonging, proposed by Peggy Levitt and Nina Glick Schiller in the same article, is crucial, I find it, for an understanding of the role of objects in transnational homing, the role of materiality in transnational homing. So in this conceptualizing of the simultaneity in migra migrants' life, they distinguish between these ways of being, the actual social relations and practices in which individuals engage in their everyday realm, and the ways of belonging, uh, meaning practices that signal consciously, demonstrate a connection to a particular group. So Simultaneity of migrants' lives in transnational social fields, of course, can impl imply both ways of being and ways of uh, belonging. And uh, it can be very well exemplified and understood by following the objects. So as shown in this book, migrants can cherish some objects that, signals belonging, that, si that signal belonging, sorry, but at the same time, they can just habitually use the other objects, even if they are also from the country of origin, but they have a totally different meaning. So by locating the research in the private sphere of people's homes, the book is promoting a focus on those aspects of migrants' experiences and practices that remain largely unexplored in research interested in the ways of belonging. So I see this book also as an example of very much balancing um, this um, with the interest of the ways of being and the ways of adapting and the ways of keeping continuities. Um, well, to illustrate what I mean, um, uh, just just a note from one of the publications of mine. I I, I think it's functioning fine uh, by by pointing at that the flags on the walls on some of some ethnic associations and images of national heroes or iconic ice, uh, landscapes in some migrant home are certainly more imposing than, for example, stashes of non-prescription medicine in bathroom closets that we must be allowed to open in order to see that they're there, or the packages of coffee or sweets that people really make a point of bringing from somewhere else. But then again, uh, as um, the authors of this book did, you need to be allowed to come very close to these private spheres, to these trivial spheres of kitchen closets or bathroom bathrooms in order to understand um, how materiality plays into homemaking in um, this transnational migration context. So in line with the definition of transnational social fields as plurally local frames of reference, transnational dwelling, homing, can be seen as providing plurilocal frames of material practices through which people can achieve that important aspect of well-being that is usually called feeling at home. And uh, this feeling at home means I feel at home because I'm being at home. So it's not about belonging, it's about being. And I am at home since I'm able to do things in a familiar manner. And that, of course, requires a particular, particular uh, familiar materiality. And even in, in refugee camps, even in uh, situations that are very far from this uh, 
transnational migrants being able to move freely and, and so on that I'm actually talking about, even in those circumstances, being able to do things in a familiar manner, even if in the most reduced circumstances is something that gives you a particular uh, stability and a particular footing. So if dwelling is about being settled in an environment that accepts us and that we ourselves, ourselves can accept, then of course, not only meanings and feelings are at stake, but also the subjectivity. And this is richly explored in the book in different chapters, in different ways. Uh, I find this really nice because <laughs> I have my own keywords as you, as you see uh, when reading this book. So these keywords are kind of reshuffling the um, existent, existent chapters in, in a very uh, interesting way and uh, point very clearly to me, very clearly to the connections between them. So this sense of being yourself in your own home or a place that you are making into your home, uh, the perceived normalcy of it all is definitely related to practical engage engagement with materiality, with particular objects. Um, in one of the chapters, we read that material culture can be a tool for self-actualization and practical such as redecoration illustrate the importance of personal engagement with the domestic environment or the con concretization of domestic relationships. However, I would say that materiality of home is also crucially related to the intimacy of bodily moves, of feels, feelings, senses and tastes. So the issue of feeling at, of, at home has a myriad of subtle material undertones that can be better understood by looking at the habituated ways of being in different socio-spatial contexts. That, of course, can be um, related to spaces out of the very home, but also uh, to the very home-making projects, uh, such as the ones that uh, people in uh, authoring this book have been reading, uh, writing about. I see that my time is uh, over. Uh, I also, I just want to say that this gives us a chance to reflect also on body and habitus. And um, there are several parts of the book that maybe do not use the language of habitus studies. Uh, and especially Gassan Haj's work on habitus and hexes that I find very, very potent in this, um, in this context. But the strength of this book is in the possibility of sustained comparisons for the theoretical reasoning, migration, mobility, speciality, temporality. But I hope that the conversations such as the ones that we have today might bring to the ideas to develop new projects that could complement and expand theoretical reasoning uh, with a more profound focus on materiality and corporeality, the habitus aspect of the very materiality connected to the materiality of homes, which I think would be a potent way of understanding the processes of home even better. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Maya, for this uh, wealth of uh, suggestions, comments, and feedbacks. I'm wondering if that's fine with the authors, we could uh, move on directly with the second discussion, Professor Rapport, and then give back the floor to the authors. So, uh, thanks, Professor Rapport, please. You should unmute uh, uh, yourself, please. Looks like we are not uh, yet able to hear you. Sorry. Not yet, no. I 
I'm just looking around. I'm not able to Hello. hear you. Ah, that, right. We can we hear are. you now. Yes, please. Thanks. Can you, can you see me? Yeah. Yes. Sorry, that's awful. Okay, so, okay, so I think so I'm using my phone rather than my my computer. Okay, so I've got to hold my phone up. All right. Um, so you can see and hear me, okay? Okay. Uh, this should be an important book. And um, I thought it made seven points that seem to me most salient. And I'm going to go through these in turn. Point number one to study home within the broader analytical category of mobility is to draw attention to the central and ubiquitous position of movement in human life and where a variety of forms of movement, literal and metaphorical, large and small scale, exceptional and mundane is to be recognized. Point number two, to study home within the broader analytical category of mobility brings into sharper focus the possible absence of what normatively might be expected to be there, that is a fixed, supposedly protective and protected homely domestic space. Here is home from without, from a distance, from the margins, highlighting the infrastructures that facilitate or hinder forms of movement. Point number three, more precisely, Shifting Roofs analyzes migrant home life in a number of European cities, in Italy, Spain, the Netherlands, Sweden, and the UK, and among migrants from the Horn of Africa, Eritrea and Somalia, from South Asia, Pakistan and India, and from South America, Ecuador and Peru, and it analyzes migrant life, exploring the diverse ways in which migrants attempt to construct home and so reveals the prevalence of exclusionary defensive discourses that make home into a contested phenomenon and a site of possible exclusion. Globalization now seems to translate as protectionism, right-wing populism, ethnic nationalism, groupism, xenophobia, and the scapegoating of immigrants. How may one now advocate for home as a human right in a cosmopolitan worldview? Point number four, Shifting Roofs deploys a persuasively broad definition of home. Home is ideally known by its boundedness, that is, it has an inside and an outside, by its security, that is, it offers a sense of protection, by its familiarity in both an emotional and a cognitive sense, by its control, giving a sense of autonomy in using a certain place, predicting the development of events in that place and expressing oneself securely. At once then home is a material setting, a set of relations and a discursive practice. So as I say, point number four, Shifting Roofs deploys a persuasively broad definition of home. Point number five, home is a prism containing a variety of possible ways of dwelling at a variety of scales from one's private place to, to a community space in, a different, in different kinds of location from a birth land to transit camps, to 
countless resettlements and encompassing possibly different times, past, present, future. That's what can be meant by home as a prism, not prison, prism, P-R-I-S-M. Point number six, home is a process in the making and a threshold to cross amid wider situations of social change. Home is made, unmade, sought for, idealized. These were the three red threads that Sarah said linked um, the different chapters and different authors. Um, these three keywords, home as a process, home as a threshold to cross, and home as something that occurs amid situations of social change. Point number seven, the final point. Above all, home is a powerful metaphor for ordering and performing social life, also while moving and settling. Albeit that nowadays people as well as objects and ideas seem to be more mobile than ever, the sense of home tends to be strongly associated still with specific places, circumstances, and significant others. Home is an embodied practice and a social routine. So these were seven salient points that I felt the book spoke to me about. Um, I'd, I'd, like to, I'd like to say two final points um, other than these seven salient points that I derived from the book. As has been explained, the book derives from a research project at Trento University on, ho on, on homing a process in contrast to the apparent stasis of dwelling. And this is conceptually fruitful, I think, homing as a transitive verb as against the uh, apparent stasis or fixity of the noun dwelling. The book argues that ways of homing, ways of making home are comparable among migrants from different parts of the world living in different countries. I would, however, like to urge a more subtle and phenomenological or existential understanding here. And if I might be personal, so we're talking about homing. And it seems to me that homing is a subtle phenomenon that must be looked into closely. My personal home might be something that's invisible to you. I might feel at home when I commune with John Stuart Mill in his writings or with Nietzsche or with the authors George Eliot or Virginia Woolf or the painter Stanley Spencer. That's when I feel that I'm homing when I'm at home. Or again, home is when I remember being a volunteer on a kibbutz in Israel. Or home is when I remember teaching in Copenhagen. Or home is when I imagine becoming famous as a writer. Or home is when I imagine my daughter or my son becoming famous as a writer. Or home is when I remember or I imagine being with my significant others. Home is when I manage to shut the world out and I'm secluded with my thoughts and emotions. In the words of the poet Philip Larkin, uncontradicting solitude supports me on its giant palm and I, like a sea anemone or simple snail, there cautiously unfolds, emerges what I am. The point I'm wanting to make is that homing, seen existentially or phenomenologically, is a very subtle, personal and possibly private individual phenomenon that bears particular attention. And I thought that the emphasis on uh, how ways of homing were comparable among migrants from different parts of the world perhaps misses out some of this phenomenological complexity and depth. The last point is that homing as a process might be something that is never of becoming or working on. 
homing might be a threshold that is never absolutely crossed or is crossed and uncrossed multiple times in multiple ways. Homing might be an aspiration that is never actually reached, like home itself might be something that is never actually reached. It's a, it's a dream, it's a drive, but it's never necessarily absolutely inhabited. I like the way that Maya in her um, discussion was urging us to uh, not abide by a distinction between migrants and locals or migrants and natives or migrants and indigenes um, in, or, or, or tochthones. There's no migrant experience as such, she was saying. And the book also says that it wants to do away with certain um, stark distinctions like home and not home. And I'd, I'd urge this further, um, the distinction between home and away from home, homing and non-homing, um, home and awayness. These are very fluid, subtle, personal, and again, phenomenological moments in individual experience. And I'd urge um, a further concentration on those ways in which um, homing and home can remain aspirations rather than achievements. Um, or as Sarah said in her intervention, uh, we're looking at a constellation of enactments. Um, in the process of homing, uh, and also a constellation of non-enactments or failed enactments. Um, so yeah, I think that's what I want to say. I want to thank uh, Alejandro, Aurora, and Sara, and uh, Paolo, and Maya, and um, I'll try and get back on the computer now and see if you can See and hear me further. Thank you.